let, let's quickly change. I want to that this is a subject that I probably get the other most calls about because they can never find people that know too much about termites. And just quickly go through termites and just again make you aware that we have two kinds: the drywood types of termites and the subterranean termites. They both have their own, you know, control strategies. Again, it's a, 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 a an old group. There, there's some 1,900 species worldwide. We have 18 here in California. Only a couple, three major species of economic importance. Again, here you can see that they're tremendously important in the ecology of the world. Here's one of the termite mounds in Africa. They take cellulose. And, and unusable wood material and leaf litter and things like that. They convert it into bioflesh, but ultimately you know, the bio material that then other animals eat. And they turn around the cellulose of the world. If we didn't have them, we would be piled in cellulose. It would be just that simple. So they're really important. But there are some bad termites, and the bad termites are a problem. In California, our, our, one of our major ones here is the western drywood termite. There's a soldier, there's the queen and the king. And uh, this is the one that uh, typically attacks the aerial parts of the structure, attic, garage, patios, you know, porches, things like that. They do not have a contact with the ground. They nest in the wood that they feed on. And again, they're easy to tell that the feeding damage on the top, this is subterranean termite damage. You can see where they're feeding with the summer and spring wood. Drywood termites are always sort of looks like Swiss cheese. And they're always these pellets associated with them. And they're quite diagnostic. If you look at the pellet under a, a, a hand lens, there's six sides to it. That is definitive. When you find a wood pellet like that, it is only a drywood termite. There's no other insects that produce such a pellet. So, you know, when the inspector comes out, that's what they're primarily looking for. They're looking for these pellets and damage <coughs> in the structure itself. So there it is. Uh, again, quite common uh, in these coastal communities. Uh, if you look at the structural inspection reports, 80 or 90 percent of structures have probably been attacked or are still infested with this coming. It's very, very common here in the coastal areas. So again, you own a home around here and it's made out of wood, you probably have had drywood termites or will have drywood termites sometime you know, in this structure's history. Again, they're just typically, uh, there are some new ways of, of locating them and whatnot, but really most of it's a visual inspection. You're just looking for the damage, you're looking for those pellets. Now, in the control strategies, there's only really two options. You either can treat the entire structure or you do what we call localized or spot treatments. The entire structures uh, is usually either a fumigation with vitamin or you heat the structure. And that's it. Those are the only choices you have. Now, in the localized uh, treatments, there are a number of electrogun, there's orange oil, borates that we talked a little bit about, other kinds of materials that can be injected in. This is a great reference. One of my former students put this together at the University of Florida. Uh, and uh, it's really, a, it sort of gives you the pros and cons of each of these localized treatments. So, you know, people ask you, well, which should I pick? You know, send them to this. Have them read that. And then, you know, then they'll be in a better position, I think, to decide how they want to, to do that. Cultural control things, really pretty limited. You can always remove the infested wood. That often is enough. If you take out a piece or two infested wood, you may get the whole colony. These colonies aren't usually very large. So I've had that situation even at my place where I've taken out a, a you know, a, a fascia board or whatnot, and that was the whole colony. Put up a new fascia board, painted it, and was done. And that's all you had to do. Typically, the termites will not uh, tunnel through painted surfaces. Uh, again, things that can be done in the attic are screens and vents. Often, uh, uh, these termites, when they swarm or whatnot, they'll hit the roof or other areas and they'll just come in through the vent system. So even in new housing complexes, they'll find all kinds of termite wings up in the attic areas, and the termites have actually swarmed in. Uh, again, um, uh, you know, you can just remove uh, dead and infested wood from around the structure. Lots of, lots of plants around here, rose bushes, uh, 
you know, dead limbs or whatnot, even a lot of trees, walnut, ash, and those will actually have dry wood termites living inside of it. So, you know, there are some things that can be done to remove them culturally. Again, just typical areas that you would find in here, these sheathing boards and these overhangs, especially where there's shade and moisture. And again, these are the areas that you would focus in on. Now, you know, one of the other ways of getting around this is, uh, like they have on this porch, is to use one of the composite lumbers. One of the tracks of these materials that are made out of plastic and woods, the drywood termites subterranean the termites will not feed on those. So again, there's just some screening in the attic. And again, uh, this trex is a pretty good material. It's expensive, but again, it's not going to be affected by wood rot, and it's not going to be affected by termites and whatnot. So you're going to get a long use, long uh, viable use out of materials like this. So if you have a lot of decorated fascia and whatnot, I, I, you know, as it becomes infested with dry woods, I get rid of it and, and go to these plastic wood materials. Again, as I mentioned, you either heat or fumigate, or uh, my preference in here in this is to use some of the new chemical injections. Uh, we have one or two materials that are really quite effective. And uh, if you're going to do that, uh, this is uh, the approach. What they typically do is they'll, they'll go in and try to find the termite gallery, drill into it, and then it's injected with one of these chemicals. The idea is, is that you contaminate the gallery, and then as the termites move around the gallery, they get the insecticide on them, and then they pass it around uh, among each other. <coughs> this is one people ask me about all the time. It's not worth buying. It's not worth using. It, it's good for about 24 to 48 hours. After that, it's no longer toxic to the termites. Now, if you use it, and you do paint the wood with it, the termites won't eat the wood. It is a preventative in that sense. So the termites will not feed on this oil. This D-limonene is an oil, and the termites won't feed on it, but they're not going to be killed by it either. So again, it, it, it's, it's not much of a preventative. If you wanted a preventative, you'd be better off with one of the borates. Tim bore, one of the other types of borate materials. Now, you know, one of the problems with this drill and treat, and I just always have to remind people, is the uh, inability to locate galleries. So it's, it's sort of like, you know, playing a detective. You don't know exactly where the termites are in the board, so you wind up drilling holes and poking until you actually find that. So typically, you have to drill a, a lot of holes. And again, sometimes the infestations are just not accessible. They'll be in the flooring, they'll be in the wall, They'll be in a place where you just can't get at it, the tree. And so ultimately then, at some point, you know, you're looking at one of these entire structure treatments. You're going to have to heat it or fumigate the structure. So again, the, you know, it, 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 a lot of it depends. We have a lot better materials now. The, these three materials are very effective. This fipronil again, that we talked about in ants. The styomethoxin is a good material. These are really great when they're injected into the wood. They're very slow acting, they're non-repellent, and the termites literally pass them to each other as they groom and clean each other. So one thing about social insect like ants is that you know they have they're really touchy feely with each other. And so if you get one treated, then they'll wind up passing it to a hundred other. And, and that's how these uh, injections actually work. So some of the new materials are, are actually quite the uh, Quite good. So if you're going to have people want to know, you know, which materials to use, these are these two are registered. This one is is the company registered it, but they also sell the fumigant. And so they told me that they couldn't make any money selling this. Well, what they did is they didn't want to take any money away from the fumigant. So quite effective. But these two are on the market and available, and those would be the ones that I would recommend for drill and inject. Uh, what, what this is called is Termidor Dry, and this one here is called OptiGuard, and it's, it's in a foam. Those are the two that, that are worth using and worth uh, doing. Again, these are the entire structure treatments. Here happens to be a, a boat here in, in Data Point. Uh, it's a very common mechanism of how drywood termites get shipped around the world. You park your boat. A termite swarm hits it, they begin eating your boat, and then you take your boat, you know, halfway across the world, and it's infested with termites. 
But you can see fumigations work quite well because the fumigant will, is not soluble in water. So when they drop the tarps down in the water, all of the fumigant stays here intact. And then, of course, this is what you see all the time around the structure. So the gas being used is, is bicane or sulfurofluoride. Again, very, very effective. It's been used for well, almost 45 years now. Thousands and thousands of homes are fumigated with this material every year. Thousands of homes. So again, quite effective. But the problem is, as soon as this tarp comes off, then you're back in, if you get a new swarm, you're back into an infestation. But the good news is that this termite takes many years for the colonies to develop again. So you're probably not looking at a fumigation for another 15, maybe 15 or 20 years. So you bought yourself a lot of time. Uh -huh. if, you're, if several of your neighbors have been tented, two questions. Uh -huh. While they're tenting, are they coming to my house? No. Or, oh, yeah. okay. or, or if there, if my neighbors have been tented, should I assume if my house is the same age that I probably should be inspected too? And probably well, the first question is, is, is you know, if, if, if your neighbor's house is being fumigated, are, are they going to come to your house? There, yeah. No. Okay. Because again, remember, the whole colony lives in a piece of wood. They've got a completely tarp. It's fumigated. Oh, and anything underneath the tarp that's living, plant, animal, anything that breathes oxygen is toast. What about the subterranean? So, no, that's a different case. We'll get the subterraneans in a minute. So that's that's a different issue. But then then the question is, it's like I told you, in these coastal areas, drywood termites are like everywhere. So if you said, what's the chances of my house having drywood termites and it's like 15 years old? I'd say it's really good. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's, but the question is, is again, they do a lot of slow damage. A lot of it is what I call oh, cosmetic type of damage. They eat out a fascia board or they eat out some trim around the window. Well, you, you can replace that. You know, so then there are, yeah. You, you, usually when you're forced to do something is when you sell and you've got an escrow, you've got to close. Oh, then yeah. there's no... It's got to be termite free, and okay. then you walk the whole nine yards. Thank you. Yeah, but yeah, we'll get to subterranean termites in a minute because yeah, this is a difference. If this kind of tending only kills what's above ground, what's down below ground is home free. So yeah, that's a, that's an issue. So fumigations, there's advantages and disadvantages. Again, uh, you know, often what I say reduce cost is that if you did a lot of localized treatment, you could very quickly run up a bill that would be the same as a, fu a fumigation. You know, uh, you know, $2,000 will typically do a, a pretty average size home, but you could run that up very quickly doing localized treatments. So you want to be a little cautious. Mm -hmm. Okay, you should remove all foodstuffs, I assume, and plant material. Sorry. Right, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, when, when the fumigations are done and everything, they have specialized bags, you know, and everything that's opened or cosmetics or food or whatnot is double bagged, put back into the refrigerator, yeah, anything like that. But uh, as far as the other things, blankets, things like that, you know, you usually don't do any kind of, because the gas is liberated into the atmosphere and, and it, what we call desorbs very quickly. Um, yeah, that, that, that's really, really not much of an issue. Yeah. Mm -hmm. One thing I wasn't aware of is when they tended our house and we live in McKinney in the North County, is that um, as a, as a um, grower, I have a lot of plants that were a little bit too close to the house. Mm -hmm. And as soon as that tarp comes down, and if you're not there saying, no, no, in, I want that tarp behind mm -hmm. the plant, not in front of the plant, it's toast, as you yeah. heard. It's gone. Yeah. And they turn yellow and they die. I've had neighbors call me to say, what happened to my plant? And that's the problem. Yeah, she's mentioning it again. Anything that you, utilizes oxygen, this is how this fumigant works. It, it, it binds up, it, it, the, the, the fluoride ions in it wind up binding up <laughs> enzymes and whatnot. And so things that need utilize oxygen get killed. So yeah, if you have these special plant situations, I, I would be, you know, you might talk to two or three fumigators, you might say, well, you know, what are you going to do to protect my plants? Because that is an issue, you know, and, and again, a lot of you are into that, so 
Again, if you have a serious rat problem, a roof rat problem, you might want to take care of that first and then do the fume. Or if you have a honeybee or things like that in the wall, you, you don't want to you would want to take care of your honeybee problem before you do anything like fume gate. So you, you wanna be yeah. Well, it's, like I said, it's a good thing and bad thing. Yeah. So again, these heat treatments are, are, are an alternative to the fumigation. The, the simple idea is we're going to heat the inside of this structure. We're going to heat the wood until it gets to be about 115 degrees Fahrenheit. 15, inside. 115? Inside. Inside the piece of wood. Typically, the air temperature in the room to do that is about 155. And it'll take an hour, a couple hours for that wood to warm up. But 30 minutes of that, and the termites are toast. A little toasties. They're all dry. And they're, that's it. So again, the heat is very effective in it, but again, there are going to be places in the structure where you might have a, a, what we call a cold sink. It could be down on the floor, or it could be behind a wall, or a furnace, or something. It might be an area where it takes some additional heat to get that up to temperature, but then that's again, this is one of these things you have to be a little careful on who you hire. You want to really someone who's experienced and knows how to do these. So again, there's always some caution, but again, quite effective. Insects do not tolerate heat very well, and especially at 115. So subterranean termites, I, I have two of them here. I, I put this one here because this is one that's also found here uh, in San Diego now, and it's a Formosan subterranean termite. Last time we worked on it was around 2000 down in the Mesa, but I don't see any reason why it's, it's probably still there and uh, a problem. Again, these subterranean termites are, are much more serious of a situation than the dry wood termites. When, when people tell you that they've had an inspection and they have these, they, they, need, they need to do some corrective things. They need to get rid of the moisture. You know, they need to have this thing treated. And, and again, it typically is going to require professional treatment. So you might have to drill through the concrete, they have to have materials injected or baits being installed, but it's typically a professional use only approach. So again, there really isn't a lot the homeowner can do themselves, but it's important to take care of this. Because this termite can actually damage the structure. Take out your flooring, take out the support beams. And so it, it can be a problem. This is the common one all along the coast. It's a western subterranean termite. These are the reproductive halates, these are going to be the new kings and queens, and they typically fly a day or two after a substantial rainfall in the spring or the fall. We get a half inch of rain and the next really nice sunny warm day, these will be taking flight. Those of you who love to watch birds and whatnot, the birds are great indicators of birds love to eat these things. The birds will just be so fat they won't be able to fly. And they'll be chirping outside, and when I hear this chirping, I, I know the termites are swarming, you know, and sure enough. But uh, these uh, typically are daytime swarmers, and uh, again, uh, usually in the fall, uh, usually in the spring. Now this is an invasive species that got established in the late 1980s over in La Mesa. And we worked on a couple streets. We got, I think we baited out one or two of the colonies, but again, they swarmed for many years. So, you know, I don't think the counties kept up with what the state has, so they, they could be a little more widespread. This one is quite distinct. If people tell you that they see these termites swarming the last few days of May, the swarm period is coming up very quickly. There will be May 25th, 26th, 20th. All in that one week period down here, it will be an evening where it's been a fairly warm, balmy afternoon, and then the wind will die off. And, and I, I used to have people on the two streets down in La Mesa, they would call me and tell me that it was the night for the swarm. They knew what night it was. They, they'd seen it year after year. They're attracted to lights, and here you can see a sticky card that was hung on someone's porch light. 
That, that was a, that was thought was an interesting thing. You know, after they, they thought about this, they thought, well, you want us to leave the lights on with these sticky traps? That means we're attracting the termites. I said, well, that's true. <laughs> but we were also we were trying to document how far they they flew. Typically, termites will, will will swarm and fly. You know, maybe a quarter of a mile or a half a mile at the most. So. So again, and here you can see the soldiers. Uh, and again, this is our our. Uh, native subterranean termite, and, and these, these guys here are these Formosan termites, and, and people will notice these because they produce a little drop of white latex, and, and this is sort of the defensive secretion. This is how they protect themselves against ants. They use these mandibles to crush the ants, and then they have their own little chemical defense system. So again, yeah, the ants and the termites have been at war for you know thousands of years. You know, I, I, I told you like. You know, 15% of the tropics' biomass are ants, about 15% of it is termites. Termites and ants are most of the biomass of the world. So, uh -huh. so if you have a good ant population, does that pretty much exclude the termites no. or not? No, they, they no. do mutually have to Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. They, they, what'll happen is she wanted to know if you have good ant populations, do you get away from, you know, with the termites? No, not what happens. The termites will dig down in the ground, and then they, they position these soldiers right at the gallery entrance way. And, and the soldiers are blind, so anything that doesn't smell like a termite, they try to chop in half. So it's like, you know, one of those vegematic things, you know? <laughs> you know, they just, you know, and so, yeah, it's just all by touch. Yeah, these are, these are amazing animals. They're all blind. There are no eyes, you know, they don't see things. They live in a total world of darkness. What, uh -huh. what percentage of structures in California have subterranean termites? What percentage? Well, subterranean termites, one of the things that's conducive to the subterranean termites is excess moisture. Mm. So, you know, we're in a fairly arid climate here, so our infestation rates are much lower, maybe 10, 15 percent. Oh, yeah. Fewer in Florida or in Texas, 75 percent of the structures might have it. Yeah. So here it's a lot less, but saying that, again, whenever we have wood in contact with the soil and you have moisture problems, let's say you're overwatering or you're letting the sprinklers hit the stucco on the side of the house, and you got the air conditioner dripping water all day down to the ground, these are things that are conducive to this termite. So yeah, you want to get rid of excess moisture. That's when they come in and do an inspection, they always check your shower pans and all of your pans for water leaks, because that's where the termites are going to hit first. Uh -huh. yeah, what about freezing temperatures with the, uh, the other, the dry wood? Is that, would that kill it? Well, yeah, she wanted to know about freezing temperatures. Yes, the, the liquid nitrogen treatment works, <coughs> and you, you can freeze termites. But think about it, you know, think about a glass of, you know, it's a liquid. You know, it's poured in, it's ice, or it's very, very cold, but it has to be confined in something. So if I inject the liquid nitrogen in the wall void, the two boards on both sides of the wall void I can freeze, but that's all I get treated. So it, 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 it wasn't a very effective means of really controlling termites. It was too costly, and it never really took off very well. So if I had the choice between heat or cold, I'd go with heat. So, so, a, so a really cold, cold climate then, aside from the liquid nitrogen, wouldn't kill a termite? Not necessarily. The, the, this subterranean termite here, that our, our flavor piece and whatnot, go all the way into Toronto, Canada. Again, as long, again remember, as long as they, you, you have a warm structure with a basement or whatnot, you see, the termites can live 10 or 15 feet down in the soil, and they're below the freezing point. And the, the temperature down there is going to be constant. See, I, I think that's what people forget sometimes. Mm -hmm. These termites live deep in the soil. So even when it's 120 on the surface, four or five foot down in the soil, it's only 78 degrees. And that's where they live. So they only come up. That's why I say they usually only come up in the spring and the fall when we're getting nice temperatures and rain. So, yeah, there's, yeah, cold, cold has, has never really worked too well. Heat is much better. It's easier to generate and it's easier to kill insects. Yes? I'm just curious. If termites are blind, how can they be attracted to light? Yeah, well, the, the, now the, the alates, the two alates, 
that the king and queen have ice. I, I should talk. The king and queen have ice because they have to go out and fly around. But everybody else in the, all the other termites in the colonies don't have any ice. Yeah. They give a swarm. It's more than just kings or queens. They don't. Well, what happens is that the new kings and queens go out, and the queen produces a, a pheromone. And she fans her, her wings over her abdomen, and the male smells that. And then he'll run up and touch her, and then they'll run around together for about 10 or 15 minutes. They get rid of the wings, they dig into the soil, and they never use their eyes again. Wow. Yeah, it's, it's all the world of, of smells and smells. <laughs> yeah. Um, yes. Right, the question is, is what's the swarming for? And, and that is, it's to spread the colony. In other words, these subterranean colonies, the new king and queen will, will get in the ground and she'll begin laying eggs and it'll take four or five years often before she has her first swarm event. The colony builds up as they utilize the food source then they get ready to produce. So when you're seeing swarming in the structure, or you know, with either subs or dry woods, you have more mature colonies there. This problem has existed for a while. Yeah, it's nothing new, you know, it's not like they just got there. Yeah, they've been there quite a while. So again, it's the same thing that we showed. This is subterranean feeding at the bottom, it's dry wood feeding. And there's a, a crawl space, and what often happens is they need contact to the soil. The nest is down here, they have these tubes then, and, and then they tunnel and they're feeding on the wood. But the main part of the colony may be 10, 15, 20 feet down in the ground. So again, it, uh, control strategies, you always want to keep out the wood debris. In other words, you don't want to have form boards in the ground. They pour some concrete, and they leave those 2 by 4s in there, I get them out. Because if you have wood in contact with the ground, and you have moisture, you're going to get subterranean termites. I guarantee it. Over time, that will happen. So, in and around, you want to get rid of that. There are some effective mechanical and physical barriers. There's actually some stainless steel mesh that's used, and the termites can chew through it. And you can actually protect the structure or protect telephone poles or other things with these little uh, 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 screens. Or pre-treatment strategies where they pre-treat the soil before they pour your concrete slab. That's not done here in California, but in Arizona it's mandatory. If you buy a home in Arizona, the soil has been pre-treated. It's because of a, a different termite that they have there. And then the soil treatments are what we call trenching or rotting. They're going to drill a hole or dig a trench, and they're going to put the insecticide in it to prevent the termite. And then finally, uh, at times, a very effective mechanism is, is baiting. This is what you want to avoid. Earthwood contacts, these form boards here where the posts and everything, it's, it's all subterranean food. I'll get into it sooner or later. It, it just, even stuff that's been treated with creosote, they'll get in a crack in there and they'll begin feeding on the inside of that. So what will happen is you get a population of termites feeding there, and then when they run out of food, then they're going to have to go find something else to eat. And if they find your house, then it, that will work too. So, um, What are you showing in the bottom left? Can you go back? Oh, what are you telling yeah, them? here they left in, they left, they, when they poured this fancy concrete work, they, they left in all of the wood oh. along here. Oh. Yeah, that, you don't want soil wood contact. If you have a soil wood contact, it needs to be pre-treated or it needs to be that composite so lumber. Mulch? Yeah, and then they mulched it and everything else, so that just adds to the moisture problem. Again, remember we need moisture and wood in contact with the soil. So yeah, bad, bad things to do. Again, uh, here you can see, you can actually see a porch that they tore away. Look at all of the wood scraps that they left in this hollow porch. <laughs> That's all termite food. So when you get done feeding on that, then they attack the house. So, and here's just another situation. They, they poured a, uh, you know, they poured this wall here, and, they, and they're going to leave all of that wood in place. It's termite food. So that's a bad idea. Now, use of chemicals is pretty important here, and the idea is, is that we're going to put a barrier underneath the house, and we're going to separate the nest from the structure, and that's what the chemical is designed to do. Now, in recent years, 
we, we've had some development of some really good materials that I call non-repellent, and they have delayed action. Very, very similar to the idea about that ant bait. They don't kill termites quickly, but they get spread and passed among the termites, so they're much more effective than the old chloridane or the old heptachlor of 50 you know, and 30 years ago. So again, some really new materials. Again, it takes a lot of equipment and whatnot, and a little bit of skill. This is why it's beyond the homeowner thing. You've got to be able to drill through these slabs, and, and again, you know, you're injecting material, you know, a gallon of material every uh, every few feet. Trenches need to be dug and whatnot. So it, again, it, it's beyond, you know, uh, most people's means. Now, in the past several years, the termite baits have become more popular. Uh, they have an insect growth regulator in them. In other words, they prevent the termites from molting. So as the little termites are growing up, they have to molt and shed their cuticle. This is where the chemical interferes with that and it kills the termite. And, and it, is, it is effective. Now, in the western United States, we don't use this as much as they do in Hawaii and Florida and whatnot. As I told you, our termites are more focused around moisture. We have smaller colonies that are more intense around these moisture problems. And, and so the baiting out here typically doesn't work as well as it does in the eastern United States and in Florida. It takes the termites a lot longer to find that bait station here. Uh -huh. I was wondering, since a lot of people are taking out their turf lawns, uh -huh. which need to be watered so often and frequently very moist, and putting in drought-tolerant gardens, could you expect if there were subterranean termites, they would start to dissipate, or would their colonies actually be eliminated or reduced? Yeah, that's a great question about uh, you know the habitat around the home. Here, as she was mentioning, you know, we're watering all these plants, we're putting out this excess moisture. Yeah, that is conducive to subterranean termites, the, the, this west coast species we have. And so yeah, as you take that out, you're, you're going to decrease the likelihood of having that particular termite problem. Now, having said that, on this side of the mountain, you're okay. But if you get on the other side of San Diego over by Yuma and down by Brawley and everything, there's a subterranean termite there called heterotermites. And it is a desert species. <laughs> and it's just the reverse. If you water the yard, you don't have a termite because it doesn't like water. So, yeah, in Arizona, so yeah, San Diego County is a, a, a two situation thing on the subs. The west side of the mountains, it's going to be this sub I showed you here. On the east side and into Arizona, you have heterotermies, and the game's all different. And we hope they don't. Yeah, yeah, I don't think they will. But yeah, they, they, they're, they're a snoring desert termite, and so they, they stick, they, they get, I think, as far north as like Cabazon. It's the farthest north that I've taken them. I've taken them in Bullhead City and a few places up the river, but yeah, they don't, they don't go up very high. So I, and they can't get across the mountains. But yeah, so yeah, that's like, yeah. So, hmm? Personal concern about IGRs. Don't they uh, get into the food source? No, gee, uh, uh, IGRs. What, what they're called are insect growth regulators. So, what they do is they interfere with the internal hormones and chemicals of insects. Okay? In other words, they turn on and turn off genes. So, when you saw that, remember that big larvae you saw, the, the, the big tobacco hornworm? Well, there's, a, there's structures in the brain, and it begins producing a chemical, and it tells the insect it's time to molt. We've got to molt into the next insect. And then there's another chemical that says, you're going to molt, but you're going to become a bigger caterpillar. And that's the IGR, the insect growth regulator. It, it, it says you're going to be another caterpillar. At some point, that's turned off, and then what happens is it turns into the pupa, and it's turned off again, and it becomes the adult. So in the termites, what these, these things do is that they affect the ability of the insect, the little termite, to make cuticle, mm -hmm. the little exterior skeleton. Mm -hmm. And since we don't have exterior skeletons, and we don't make cuticle like that, we're, we're OK. Mm -hmm. But how about other animals that might some, yeah, that's true. That's true. But again, you know, we like have this. Bird, for oh, well, birds don't have that that issue either. So yeah, you could have some other insect maybe, 
you know, where they would feed on it. Ingest. Yeah. You know, some of the, you know, some of the GM plants are, are you know, they're, they're trying to incorporate IGRs and things into it. That's why I'm concerned. Yeah. But no, in this particular case, you know, what they do is, this, this termite bait, what that is is it's a piece of cellulose, essentially. They, it's like pulp, and they, they put the IGR in it. So only insects that eat these are like termites. I, I, these, these make great ant houses, because ants get in there, and they get the termites, and it makes a, a wonderful nest. Argentine ants love to nest in these things. So, but yeah, they, they're not affected by the IGR at all. So yeah, you have to eat it. And, and, and again, it, it's more complicated than that. They're, each insect has a, not all insects have the same IGR. There's like five or six different brands, sort of, if you will. And so the, the one that's in the termites is, is a relatively primitive IGR. Yeah. So it, it, it's, it's really a, a pretty safe way. The problem I have in the, in the Western United States is it just takes a lot of time for this system to work. And if you have a really bad problem, it's better to get it spot treated and get the termite problem erected. Then if you want to go to bathing, that's that's fine. But you know, I, I would advise, you know, if you have a leaky shower pan, you've got subterranean termites in there, get the shower pan fixed, get the area spot treated, and then if you want to bait for the long run, that's fine. But sort of do it stepwise. And again, it, it, it's just this idea that they feed on the bait, they take it back to the nest, and, and, and you're actually killing the termites out. And, and again, it's, it's, it's been pretty effective. 